Oh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Today, I'm super excited to present to you our next speaker, Sergey Levin. Uh, he received a bachelor's and master's in computer science from Stanford in 2019 and a PhD in computer science from Stanford in 2014. And he joined the faculty of the Department of Electrical Engineering and CS at US Berkeley and UC Berkeley in 2016. His work focuses on machine learning for decision making and control with an emphasis on deep learning and RL algorithms. Sergey has done a lot of incredible uh, work that a lot of us probably already know with important pioneering work in end-to-end -end deep learning for robotics, uh, more sample efficient RL algorithms like the soft actor critic, meta learning like MAML, multitask learning, allowing RL agents to learn from existing experiences with offline RL, and of course, unsupervised learning within the RL framework, which is what he will talk to us uh, about today. So if you're ready, Sergey. Uh, go ahead. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, all right, um, I'm going to get started and uh, definitely feel free if you guys want to ask questions during the talk. Um, you know, it's a kind of a smaller group, so we can have a little more discussion. Um, okay, let me see, I got everything set up here. Okay, but um, I'll di dive into it. So uh, here's a kind of a, a big question to start us off. Why does machine learning uh, work? Well, um, of course, there's a lot of algorithmic advances, a lot of stuff that, that we work on day to day. But at a very high level, a lot of the uh, most successful machine learning systems are predicated on two uh, central ingredients, the ability to utilize large and diverse data sets uh, and uh, large and high capacity models. Now, what do these models actually do? Well, they uh, solve tasks like recognizing objects and images, translating text, recognizing speech, things that kind of look like recognition or prediction problems. But um, if we step back a little bit, um, we can ask maybe an even more basic question. Why do we need machine learning? Like, why do we need machine learning to solve these problems? Um, and as an aside, uh, we can ask an even more basic question. Why do we need brains? You know, but, but at some level, machine learning is about creating a kind of artificial brain. So why do we need natural brains? Uh, well, uh, we can ask a fellow who knows quite a lot about brains, uh, a neuroscientist, Daniel Walpert, and uh, he has this to say on the topic. We have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movements. Movement is the only way we have of affecting the world around us. I believe that to understand movement is to understand the whole brain. So you could say this is maybe a little bit of a reductionist perspective, but uh, it has a certain truth to it, that ultimately, uh, essentially, the utility of your brain uh, is entirely in uh, the outputs that it produces. Uh, so uh, at the level of an input output system, it's mainly useful because it produces the right outputs, which in the case of a human brain are the movements of a human body. Uh, so can we apply the same logic to machine learning? Uh, I would put forward a postulate that we, we need machine learning for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex decisions. So what does this really mean? Uh, well, if you're using machine learning to control a robot, maybe it's fairly obvious what it means. You know, your decisions are how you move the robot's joints. If you are uh, controlling an autonomous vehicle, then your decisions are how to steer a car. And now you might say, wait a minute, uh, but what if I'm uh, training a classifier to recognize objects and images? That's kind of, it, that kind of seems like a different type of problem. Uh, what is the decision? Maybe it's the image label. Well, I would say usually not. Um, usually if you have a machine learning system that looks like a recognition system, it's really embedded inside of a decision-making framework uh, you might just not formalize that when you set it up as a machine learning problem. But for this image recognition system, you could say, well, what happens to the label afterwards? Once you've produced the label, is it used to tag a user's photo? Uh, is it used to detect an endangered animal in a camera trap because you want to count how many of those animals there are? You know, all these things are decisions and they lead to downstream consequences. So in most of these cases, or I would say actually in all of these cases, insofar as they're useful in the real world, the end goal is not the particular recognition, but some kind of decision that you make with that recognition afterwards. So machine learning is really automated decision-making, whether we uh, frame it that way or not. Now, typical supervised learning problems frame the problem the way they do instead of as a decision-making problem, because it makes it easy. Uh, it allows you to assume things like independent data points, that your outputs don't influence future inputs, and that ground truth labels are provided at training time. 
Now, I would say these are all things that are actually false in reality, but they're very con convenient fictions to assume to make your machine learning problem much more manageable. Now, if you have something that is much more overtly a decision-making problem, maybe it's hard to make those assumptions. And uh, decision-making problems usually don't satisfy these. Usually current actions influence future observations. The goal is to maximize some utility, like a reward function, uh, which is not as simple as maximizing the probability of the data. And the optimal actions are not necessarily provided. You might be provided with some data, but uh, it, in general, you can't actually assume that it's optimal. But I would go further and say that these are not actually just issues in control. In many cases, real world deployment of ML, ML systems has these same feedback issues. So all those things at the top that ostensibly make a supervised learning problem easier, I would say that they're actually generally things that don't hold in reality, although they might hold approximately. Um, as an example, as a thought experiment, imagine that you are using supervised learning to build a system that predicts uh, traffic patterns uh, as part of an app that provides people with driving instructions. Well, the decisions made by a traffic prediction system will affect the route that people take, and that route will change the traffic. So unbeknownst to you, or at least unbeknownst to your machine learning system, it is in fact making decisions and its inputs and outputs are not independent, although framing it that way might make it very convenient to employ relatively simple algorithms. So if ultimately machine learning is always about making a decision, why don't we treat every machine learning problem like a reinforcement learning problem? Reinforcement learning is the branch of machine learning that helps us deal with decision making. So why don't we make everything overtly a decision making problem? Uh, or put another way, why aren't we all using reinforcement learning? Well, there's actually a reason for this, right? It's, it's not arbitrary. There's a reason why uh, supervised learning is such a powerful and popular framework. And it's because reinforcement learning is really two different things. On the one hand, it's a framework for learning-based decision-making. So it's, it's basically a framework for doing this, for mapping inputs X to outputs Y based on dense and strong supervision. Uh, so, so supervised learning is this. Reinforcement learning is a framework for uh, learning, uh, for mapping states to actions, for making decisions. So I talked before about the difference between these in the case of the decision-making, uh, it's not IID, uh, it's not densely supervised strongly with the correct labels and the goal is to maximize utility uh, rather than just likelihood, right? So there's a difference between these. Um, and arguably the lower, lower one is preferred. So the decision influences the next input and reinforcement learning takes care of all this. Um, but reinforcement learning is also something else. It's also a framework for active online learning uh, for control. Now, not all learning is active online. So, there, uh, so there, there's, there's a difference here. This is the, the classic diagram from the Sutton and Bardo textbook, where you have an agent that interacts with the environment in this kind of loop. So you make a decision, you collect a little bit of data, you use that data to refine uh, your hypothesis about the world or your hypothesis about what the optimal policy is, and then you repeat. Uh, so this is kind of the, this reinforcement learning loop that is repeated many different times. Um, and we should recognize that one and two are really separate things. So one is about solving decision-making problems, which is highly desirable. Uh, basically, almost all real-world learning problems look like this. Number two is very naturalistic and appealing, like you'd say this is how people and animals learn, but almost all real-world learning problems make it very difficult to do this. They make it very difficult to have an online active learning uh, paradigm. Imagine that you are uh, learning to control an autonomous car. It would actually be quite undesirable to learn to control that car by bumping into things and learning from those collisions. That's very costly and expensive. So even though number two is very naturalistic, it, we could say it resembles how humans and animals learn, it's a very awkward framework to apply to many practical real world settings. So once we recognize that one and two are uh, not uh, inseparable parts of a single thing, but they're actually separate ingredients uh, of this framework that we call reinforcement learning, um, we could try to uh, uh, think about how to do things better. Now, at this point, some of you might say, well, do we really need to worry about this, right? Uh, reinforcement learning seems to work in practice. There's all these uh, problems that our RL algorithms seem to solve decently well, including beating the world champion at Go. That seems like a really difficult problem. So is there really any issue for us to contend with? Um, and to convince you that there is, if you, uh, if you don't agree with me on this, we can just look at the pictures. So we can look on the left at the examples of the kinds of problems that reinforced learning algorithms have solved very well. And on the right, we can look at 
examples of problems that supervised learning has solved very well. And there are different problems. You could say that, well, maybe playing Go is, is actually more difficult than recognizing objects and images because any person can recognize objects and images, whereas not every person can beat the world champion at Go. But there is a really big gulf between these examples. And the way that I would summarize that is by saying that all the examples on the left are really closed world environments. So the settings where RL does really well, whether they're real world or simulated, they're settings that are um, kind of, uh, that have neatly delineated boundaries where we know what happens, what's, what's sort of inside the box and what's outside the box. So when you're playing Go, you don't have to worry about your opponent uh, spilling coffee on the Go board or like knocking it over and getting angry and storming out of the room. Like that's outside the rules of the game. That's just simply not something you have to concern yourself with. So it's a closed world environment. Whereas if you're recognizing objects and images, well, anything can happen. You could have an autonomous car driving down the road and a, a man in a chicken suit walks across. And then you have to say, well, is that a man or is that a chicken, right? So it's a, this weird situation, but because you're in an open world environment, basically you have to assume that anything that could happen will. So, um, and, and the effect of that difference, the difference between a closed world and an open world is that in the open world environment, you have to really concern yourself with generalization. And when you have to concern yourself with generalization, then you need large and representative and diverse data sets. And that's something that the RL success stories on the left are not currently handling. So uh, can we make RL look more like supervised learning? Can we make it look more like a methodology that can utilize large and representative data sets? So I talked about how RL is these two different things. It's a framework for online active learning and it's a framework for making decisions. So on policy RL is kind of the, uh, the, the classic example of this online active framework where you have a policy that interacts with the world, collects a little bit of data, the data is used to update the policy, uh, and then the policy collects some more data and the process repeats. Uh, but we don't have to do it this way. We could actually formulate a framework for offline reinforcement learning where uh, you have a data set, all, all you're given is a data set. Now you could make an assumption that that data set was collected with a behavior policy but you don't really know what that behavior policy is. And that behavior policy could have been basically anything. So maybe a person drove the car and then gave you a data set for autonomous driving, maybe a hand engineered uh, temperature regulation mechanism controlled the HVAC system in the building and then gave you uh, traces from that. So it could have been anything and maybe it could have been many different things. But you're just given a data set and you're going to use this data set to produce the best policy you can. So if, if all machine learning is decision-making, well, arguably virtually all machine learning methods that are actually used uh, at an industrial scale are making decision are doing decision-making with this abstraction. They're given a data set and they produce a decision-making mechanism. So we're gonna do the same thing with RL. Now, I, I, I don't wanna like kind of place too much uh, excessive emphasis on the offline part, because of course, in reality, the capacity for RL to improve online is a major strength. So what we would probably want in reality is to use an offline reinforcement learning methodology to get a policy with some basic co competence and then deploy it and get it to further improve online. Like there's kind of nobody stopping you from doing that second part. But it's really the offline phase that is a major algorithmic challenge right now. So that's what I'll focus in, on in today's talk about how we can analyze lots of data from the world and then analyze and then understand the world through how our actions affect it. And that's basically what offline RL does. Um, I'll, I'll actually mention, come back to some of the unsupervised things at the end, but most of the talk will focus on offline RL methodology. Um, so if we can develop successful offline RL methods, then our workflow will look something like this. Step one will be to collect the data set using any policy or mixture of policies. And this might not actually involve you collecting the data. It might involve like going out and finding some data on the internet, which is what everybody who does supervised learning is currently doing. So we're kind of going to do what they do. And this might be data of humans performing the task. It might be some existing system performing the task. It might be random behaviors, or it might be any combination of the above. And critically, if we have an effective offline RL method, we don't have to make very strong assumptions about uh, properties of that data. We don't have to assume that it illustrates optimal behavior. It could be random behavior. It could be behavior from multiple different uh, decision-making mechanisms. And crucially, we should only have to do this once. Now, of course, in reality, real life is never quite that simple. So it could be that we will discover that our data is simply inadequate for covering some part of the problem. And even in supervised learning, of course, people do go back and refine their data set. So uh, we don't have to do it only once, but ideally we would only do it once if we did it right. 
Step two is run offline RL on this data set to acquire the best policy you can, essentially the best policy that is supported by the data. Step three is to deploy this in the real world. And if you're not happy with how well it does, which oftentimes you won't be, maybe you didn't set up some uh, aspect of your method correctly, then you can modify the algorithm and go back to step two, but you don't necessarily have to go back to step one. So you could reuse the same data. And that's of course very powerful. It'll allow you to uh, iterate much more quickly. So this could be applied to you know, problems in robotics, but also problems that we don't often think of as reinforcement learning problems. So you can imagine applying this paradigm, for example, for the inventory management for a major e-commerce and warehousing company, right? You know, if, if you're doing inventory management and controlling you know, 10,000 warehouses across multiple countries, doing online trial and error reinforcement learning might seem like a really bad idea. But on the other hand, you probably have lots of data from historical logs of what how your system behaved in the past that you could use to essentially optimize its strategy. You could imagine using this kind of approach to construct policies for proposing treatment plans for doctors. You really don't want to do trial and error learning for prescribing drugs to patients. That's a pretty bad idea. You know, you don't want to go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, well, today, today we're going to have exploration day. We're going to pick a random drug off my shelf and see how you react to it. Well, no, that's not how you want medicine to work. But on the other hand, you do probably have lots of logs of previous uh, drugs that patients have been prescribed, if you can get over the privacy issues, uh, and that can be analyzed to provide an improved uh, prescription recommendation strategy, for instance. Uh, you know, you probably can still have a physician in the loop that actually looks at this thing, uh, but it would probably improve matters. Uh, scheduling the course of scientific experiments, if you want to synthesize a drug or, uh, you know, to determine how some particular molecule behaves, you could analyze previous sequences of experiments and propose a better uh, experiment plan. Uh, of course, problems in robotics, problems in autonomous driving, energy grid management, finance, etc. These are all domains where this kind of recipe could be applied. So in today's talk, I'm going to first discuss why offline RL is difficult, basically why, why we even have to worry about the problem. Why can't we just apply off-the-shelf standard methods? How do we design offline RL algorithms? How do we evaluate offline RL methods? And lastly, how do we apply them? And what are some good things that happen when we apply them? So let's start with a challenge. Let's look at technical aspects of this and discuss why this problem merits uh, additional algorithmic effort. Uh, so first, a quick primer on off-policy RL. This is going to be like pretty basic stuff that those of you that have a background in reinforcement learning probably already know, but I'll just go over it so that we have the same notation. Um, so in reinforcement learning, you have an agent, and that agent takes actions. We call them A. Uh, and the world responds with states S and a reward, R, uh, which is a function of S, comma A. Typically, you don't assume you actually know R, but you assume that you uh, observe the reward for the transitions that were taken. Uh, and then your goal is to design a policy, which is a distribution over actions conditioned on states denoted by pi. So the RL objective is to maximize the expected reward of the designed policy. Uh, I use the word design in the same manner as in controls, meaning you know, in RL you're gonna learn the policy. A very useful object for performing this maximization is the Q function. The Q function tells you if you start in state ST and then take, an, uh, take action AT, and then after that you follow the policy pi, what will be the total reward in expectation that you will accumulate? Uh, typically, we would put a discount factor in there, but I'm just omitting that for simplicity. If you can acquire the Q function for a particular policy pi, then you can always recover a new policy that is at least as good or better by taking the action that maximizes Q pi. This is the basis of policy iteration. So it immediately suggests an algorithm where you have your current policy, figure out its Q function, recover a new policy by doing the arg max, figure out its Q function, recover a new policy and repeat. That's policy iteration. Um, you could also cut out the middleman and actually directly improve the Q function by putting the maximization right in the Q function training objective. So if you minimize the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation, this is the Bellman equation, meaning that you make the Q value for every SA pair equal to the reward plus the max of the Q value at the next state, then you will recover the optimal Q function and its corresponding greedy policy will be the greedy policy, will be the optimal policy. So if you can enforce this equation in all states, you basically have an effective RL algorithm, which is the basis of Q learning. Um, and one way you could imagine doing this is you could imagine taking some samples 
and minimizing the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the Spellman equation at those samples. Um, so typically we, we would do this with minimizing squared error and we would write it uh, as you know, Q minus Y where Y represents these target values. And this talk focuses entirely on dynamic programming methods, basically value-based methods. There are other methods that are not value-based for doing offline RL, such as importance sampling, but I'm not gonna get into that. I'll focus on value-based methods because I think that today these are basically the most scalable approaches. Okay, so the reason that this can form a basis for an offline method is that in order to enforce the, the Bellman equation, you don't need the data to be on policy. So you could take any SA tuples and uh, you could uh, evaluate the Bellman equation. So this immediately suggests a recipe for off-policy Q-learning. Collect a data set using some policy, add it to your buffer, sample a batch from that buffer, minimize the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side on that batch, repeat this some number of times, and if you like, after that, go out and collect more data. Uh, you can represent this graphically like this. You're interacting with the world, collecting these transitions. So uh, we call this tuple S A S prime R a transition because it's transition from S to S prime, where you collected the reward R. You're going to put this in your buffer and you're going to run your off-policy Q learning on that buffer. And occasionally you'll go back out and collect more data. But if you're doing offline learning, then of course you would omit this step. And, if, and as I mentioned before, more typically you would do offline learning and then online fine tuning. So you might still have that step at the end uh, after uh, training is all done. Uh, okay, so does this work? Can we use essentially Q learning methods to uh, do offline reinforcement learning? About um, three years back, we actually ran a large scale deep RL experiment at Google, which uh, combined offline RL and online fine tuning. And as part of this experiment, we got kind of a preliminary uh, answer to this question, like what, what goes wrong when, when we try to do this. So in this system, we have uh, robots that are collecting data. Uh, they're collecting data for a very simple but very important task, which is robotic grasping. Um, and we're storing all the data from all, all of our past experiments, basically anything we ran in this uh, framework we stored to disk. So we have millions of uh, transitions from previous experiments. And we also have online fine tuning. Uh, and it's a large parallel system for uh, essentially a, a version of Q-learning. We call it QT-OP because it's continuous action Q-learning with an optimization process for the target value, but it's basically Q-learning. Um, so what happened? Uh, well, the uh, important thing is that uh, it worked. Offline pre-training, especially followed by online fine-tuning, did very, very well. So you can get uh, a deep RL system that generalizes very effectively to lots of very complex uh, grasping scenarios. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm not gonna focus on how well it worked. I'm actually gonna focus on where it fell short. So we had this uh, test set consisting of never before seen objects, and we evaluated performance on this test set, but we actually evaluated two different policies, a policy trained on all previous data, as well as a policy that then received online fine tuning. Uh, the previous data consisted of 580,000 episodes. Each episode was between 10 and 50 transitions. So it's um, you know, several million transitions. And then we compared that to a policy that was fine-tuned online for an additional 28,000 episodes. Now you'll notice that the amount of online fine-tuning is actually pretty modest. So if the online fine-tuning makes a big difference, it's most likely because it's online, not because it's simply increasing the data set size, because the increase in data set size is very modest, about 5%. So the success rate of the fine-tuned strategy on the test set was 96% which is very good. This is uh, essentially, despite being done three years ago, this is still the state-of-the-art system for robotic grasping from monocular RGB images. With depth, you can do a bit better, but from RGB, this is the best the, that any system has done. Um, but if you only use the offline data, then your success rate is 87%. You could say 87% is pretty good, right? Well, um, you can translate this into a failure rate, um, which is maybe more salient because what you care about is how often it failed to pick. The failure rate, 100 minus this, is 4% for the fine-tuned strategy, and it's 13% for the offline strategy. So your failure rate increases by more than a factor of three. So there is really a, a big gap here. And this is a very large data set with very good coverage. So this is, in some sense, the best case scenario for offline RL. Uh, in less ideal scenarios, it actually does a lot worse. So something is going on here. The standard naive uh, Q-learning method, even though in principle it should work in the off-policy setting, appears to struggle. So why is it so hard? Uh, 
uh, about, uh, about two years after these experiments, uh, uh, we uh, studied this question uh, a little bit and we had a few hypotheses. Um, so just, I'll, I'll give you some intuition first and I'll describe some of our hypotheses and some of our experimental results. Fundamentally, the problem in offline IRL is that in order to do the offline training, you need to provide responses to counterfactual queries. So imagine that you're driving a car uh, and your data consists of you know, fairly decent human drivers, not perfect human drivers that you can still do better than the human, but there are certain things that human drivers generally don't do. They will not be driving on a straight road and just randomly decide to swerve off the road. What the offline RL algorithm essentially needs to figure out is it needs to figure out if I were in the same situation that, that uh, the data portrayed, but I took a different action, would the outcome have been better or worse? Because if you want to improve on what was dem demonstrated in the data, you need to be able to answer this question. So is this a good action or a bad action? And how do you know if you didn't see it in the data? Well, the answer is that sometimes you can generalize and sometimes you can't. So if you believe that you can generalize and figure out that this action is actually better than the action that was taken in the data set, good, you should go and do that. But sometimes you cannot generalize and sometimes the naive approach to training a neural net will not generalize and it will not know that it will not generalize. So online RL algorithms don't have to handle this because they can simply try this action and see what happens. They can say, oh, the, in the data, you never swerved off the road. Well, let's swerve off the road and see what happens. Maybe something really good happens when you do that. Maybe as soon as you swerve off the road, there's like a pot of gold there and you get lots of money and everyone's happy. But that's not the case. That's not actually what happens when you do that. And offline RL methods don't have the luxury to try it and see. They have to somehow account for these unseen out of distribution actions, ideally in a safe way, while still making use of generalization to come up with behaviors that are better than the best thing in the day. So how does this problem show up? Um, well, uh, we didn't actually fully appreciate this counterfactual thing when we started this research. Um, so two of my students, Avril Kumar and Justin Fu, we uh, tried to see what would happen if we just naively apply uh, off policy value-based methods. Uh, and we took the half cheetah benchmark, we collected data sets of different sizes, uh, and we tried to see what happens when we train on them. And um, initially what we saw is that performance kind of goes up a little bit and then it drops down. So we thought, well, surely this is like classic overfitting. So we'll increase the data set size and see if that helps. So here, uh, the x-axis is not number of uh, data points. The x-axis is actually number of gradient steps on the same data set and the different colors denote data sets of different sizes. So blue is 1000, transitions red is 1 million. And they all drop, um, but the red one is not any better than the blue one. So that's a very strange kind of overfitting where increasing the data set size doesn't appear to solve the problem. Um, so then we did another diagnostic. We said, well, let's actually look at the Q values, right? The Q values are predictions of expected reward. The reward that the agent is getting here is minus 250. Good reward on half cheetah is around 10,000. Let's see if the Q values think that it's gonna get minus 250 or do they think it's gonna get 10,000? The y-axis here is a log scale, and it doesn't think that it's going to get minus 250, and it doesn't think it's going to get 10,000. It thinks it's going to get uh, 10 to the seventh power. That's the red curve. It's a little bit more than 10,000. The blue curve is even higher. It goes up to 10 to the 20th power. So that's kind of weird. Um, why is that happening? So it hasn't seen rewards of uh, or, or, or trajectories with values of 10 to the seventh power. Uh, something very strange is going on here. And it turns out that that um, counterfactual query thing is basically the explanation. But to see why it's the explanation for this, we need to understand distributional shift. So let's talk about distributional shift in a nutshell. Usually when you're uh, training a model to, to, to do something, let's say you're doing regression, you're solving what's called an empirical risk minimization problem. Empirical risk minimization means you take a training set from some distribution, you minimize your empirical risk, meaning your risk on that data set, and you hope that this will actually solve the problem. That is empirical risk minimization. So if you minimize your error in expectation under some training distribution P of X by generating samples from P of X and minimizing the empirical risk, um, you could ask a very basic question. Given some test point X star, is my prediction on X star going to be correct? Meaning is F theta of X star correct? That would seem like the most basic question in machine learning. It turns out to be surprisingly difficult to answer. But there are a few things that you know. For example, if you minimized empirical risk and you did not overfit, then the expected value of your loss 
under p of x should be low. That's what it means to not overfit. However, the expected value of your loss under some other distribution, p bar of x, may not in general be low if p bar of x is not equal to p of x. Furthermore, if x star is drawn from the distribution p of x, even then it's not necessarily guaranteed that the loss on x star will be low because you're minimizing the loss in expectation rather than point-wise. It's actually very difficult to minimize the loss point-wise. So empirical risk minimization makes it very easy to minimize the loss in expectation, but minimizing it point-wise with samples is very hard. Now, usually we don't worry about any of these things because if we are good deep learning researchers, then we're gonna follow the deep learning mantra, which is that neural nets will generalize well and you can forget about statistics. Um, usually I would actually agree with this. I think neural nets do generalize very well, but we can make the problem much worse so that even the power of neural nets doesn't save us. What if we pick X star, not randomly, but we actually pick it to maximize F of X or minimize F of X, it's the same thing, but to get some kind of extramal value of F of X. Well, imagine that this green curve is the true function and the blue curve represents our fit. The blue curve represents F theta of X. In most places, the blue curve is a very good fit to the green curve. But if I pick the point that maximizes f theta of x, I'm going to, you, you can see what I'm going to get. I'm going to get that point where the error is maximized in the positive direction. In fact, this is more or less the recipe for producing adversarial examples. You can think of adversarial examples as minimizing the probability of the true label or maximizing the probability of an incorrect label. So if I maximize the value of my function, I'm going to get an adversarial example, a point where it makes the largest mistake. So even if mistakes are very low on average, uh, I can find that bad point. So what does this have to do with Q-learning? Well, let's go back to this Bellman equation and let's write it in a slightly different but equivalent way. Instead of writing it as a max, I'm gonna write it as an expected value under pi nu, where pi nu is that argmax policy. So I didn't actually change anything. I just wrote it in a way that makes it clear that uh, the, the Bellman equation requires evaluating expectations, but expectations under the distribution pi nu. So these target values, or I'm gonna call them y, my training objective is to regress onto y. So that's good, that's what we want. But under a very particular distribution, the distribution I'm gonna call pi beta. That's my behavior policy. That's the distribution that collected my data set. So that's the equivalent of p of x on the previous slide. And I'm going to use my q function in expectation under pi nu. So this is exactly that mismatch from before. I expect good accuracy if pi beta is equal to pi nu, but how often does that happen? The whole point is to improve over pi beta, to make pi nu be a better policy than pi beta. So in general, they will not be equal. And even worse, pi nu is selected to maximize Q. So that's that adversarial example from, uh, problem from before. And now that explains why we see the values getting so high. The reason the Q values blow up like that is because when we maximize them, we're basically finding those adversarial examples. And all this curve shows is that we succeed at doing that. So that's the problem that we're faced with. This is the, the basic fundamental problem with building offline RL algorithms. This is not actually a problem that is exclusive to value-based methods. The problem that we, have to, that we have to answer counterfactual queries is true for any offline RL methods. Any, any decision-making method that has to make a better decision using data has to contend with making counterfactual queries, which always manifests as distributional shift the, the only difference between different algorithms is where that distributional shift shows up. And in Q-learning methods, it shows up in the target values. For other methods, it will show up elsewhere. So how do we design offline RL algorithms that deal with this issue? Well, I'll give you a brief overview of kind of the, the classic concepts in the literature for addressing this. And then I'll talk about two types of approaches that have worked out really well for us, which uh, uh, seem to be uh, kind of most effective. So, one thing you could do is you could say, the problem is that your pi nu is too different from pi beta. So what you can do is you can actually explicitly represent pi nu instead of doing it implicitly with a max and impose some constraint on it. So you can say that pi nu shouldn't just uh, maximize Q as best it can. What it should do is it should obey some constraint, such as for example, that the divergence between it and pi beta should be limited. So you can have, for example, a constrained actor critic method. Now, maybe this solves the distribution shift problem, right? Maybe no more erroneous values. Well, uh, kind of, yes. So actually there's an entire class of methods. Uh, they don't really have a name. So I'm gonna call them policy constraint methods just to give them a name. 
Uh, and it's actually a very old idea. Uh, it goes back uh, decades, in fact, to work by Emmanuel Todorov and Bert Kappen on things like passive uh, uh, dynamics and linearly solvable MDPs, as well as KL divergence control. Uh, more recently, it's the basis of things like trust region methods, covariant policy gradients, natural policy gradients, and has also appeared in a number of recent papers, uh, examples of which I, I have here on this slide, all revolving around this basic principle of using a KL divergence constraint to constrain your policy against some previous policy and utilizing that as a way to address distributional shift. And it does work to a degree, but it has two issues uh, when applied in the offline RL setting. One is that we usually don't know the behavior policy. So if we're doing something like a trust region policy gradient, it's great because pi beta is just our previous policy. But in the offline RL setting, pi beta might be unknown. It might be uh, human provided data, data from hand designed controllers, data from many past RL runs. Uh, it might be a mixture of all these things. The second issue is that this strategy can be both too pessimistic and not pessimistic enough. So to, to, to see this, imagine that pi beta is a random policy. Now, a random policy is not very good, but it is potentially quite useful for offline RL because a random policy has full support, meaning that nothing is out of distribution for a random policy. Now, a classic KL divergence constraint will do something very, very strange if pi beta is a uniform random policy. It'll basically say, you are not allowed to come up with a new policy that is too deterministic. That's a very strange thing to do. It's like saying, well, if your data has very good coverage, very good data, you should be very noisy. That's a very strange thing to say. And being very noisy could be very bad. If you're walking along the edge of a cliff, you really don't want to be noisy. You want to be pretty deterministic. So uh, this might be uh, not pessimistic enough. Um, it might, on the other hand, be too pessimistic. In some cases, you might be able to make extrapolations from the data. You might be able to, you know, let's say the data shows two things. You can pick one of those two things to do. A KL divergence constraint will say, well, no, you shouldn't concentrate on one of those things too much. Um, so it's kind of an, a non-ideal constraint. There are two principles that are a little different from this that we found to work very well. Option one, don't use a KL divergence constraint, but construct an RL algorithm that avoids ever evaluating actions that are not in the data set. So if you can somehow stick to only actions in the data set and yet still do maximization, then things will work. So if these black points are your training points and this blue curve is your fit, well, your fit might be pretty bad in some places, but as long as you stick to the black points somehow, uh, then you'll avoid the problem. Option two, uh, train the Q function so that out of distribution actions never have high Q values. So this is a very different philosophy. It's saying, instead of sticking to the good stuff, actually find the bad stuff, go and hunt it down and fix it. Like find those erroneous peaks and push them down. Now you can't fix the problem in the sense that you can't make the Q function correct everywhere. What you can do is you can fix the problem by making it not overestimate everywhere. So you'll still make a mistake. You just won't make a mistake in the positive direction. And that's actually possible. So let's talk about option two. Let's talk about avoiding out of distribution actions. And I'll kind of build this up over the course of several works. I'll start with some work that was uh, uh, led by my student Ashwin Nair uh, called uh, Accelerating Online Reinforcement Learning with Offline Data Sets. And this is based on a previous method called Advantage Weighted Regression. Um, so the idea here is uh, we're going to have a method for optimizing the policy. Well, for, we're going to focus on just the policy for now that avoids uh, any out of distribution actions and, in fact, any out of sample actions. So here's the classic actor critic algorithm. And this thing does suffer from out of distribution actions because the policy update will find uh, out of distribution actions that maximize the Q function. And it will query values of QSA that are not in the data set. And those values might have mistakenly high Q values. Um, so can we modify this? Can we train the actor without querying out of distribution actions? Well, uh, what if we train the actor with weighted regression? What if we uh, actually take only the states and actions that are in the data set and try to basically copy those actions? Now, just doing that is not a good idea because you're not improving over the data set. But what if you then go and weight them, right? So don't just copy the actions, copy them with some weights. And select those weights so that good actions have higher weights than bad actions. So we're going to essentially selectively behavior clone the data set and we'll behavior clone the good actions with stronger weights. Well, it actually turns out that if you're very careful in choosing these weights based on your current Q function, 
you can show that it's actually equivalent to a constrained optimization for the actor. So in particular, if you choose the weights to be proportional to the exponentiated Q values with some uh, Lagrangian multiplier, one over lambda, then you can actually prove that uh, this optimizes a sample-based estimate to the constrained optimization problem from before. Uh, and lambda here actually acts as a Lagrange multiplier that determines epsilon. It turns out to actually be quite straightforward to show this via Lagrangian duality. I won't go into this uh, result in this talk uh, in the interest of time, but you can check out the paper for the derivation. So that's pretty cool. We can actually take an optimization that doesn't require uh, any out of sample actions. It looks like empirical risk minimization, but with weights and get it to actually perform this constrained optimization. And if the constrained optimization is successful, then the subsequent Q value updates you know, they might be okay in the same sense that the policy constraints make them okay. Um, so this is the basis of advantage weighted actor critic. And one of the things it does really well is offline pre-training followed by online fine tuning. I'll tell you right now, it's not actually a great method for pure offline training because for the same reason that policy constraint methods are not that great. So it, it's a way to do policy constraints basically, uh, but it can be the basis for a really good offline RL method I'll describe later. In its basic form though, it's a decent method for offline pre-training followed by online fine-tuning. And in that regime, it actually works pretty well. Um, so here uh, in this animation, uh, we took some um, demonstration runs for a dexterous manipulation task. And that by itself gets a success rate of 24% from offline pre-training. But if we then follow by doing online fine-tuning with the same exact method, that gets it up to 88%. And that actually works pretty well, significantly better than all other offline pre-training online fine-tuning methods. I won't go into too much detail uh, about the results, uh, but what I want to get to is um, taking this idea and turning it into a really effective purely offline method. And to do that, we have to also avoid all out of sample queries in the Q func function update also. Because even though the policy constraint method should in principle avoid out of distribution actions, it only does so asymptotically. So in the middle of training, we might still get some pretty crazy out of distribution actions in there. It, it's not as bad as the fully adversarial thing, but it's still pretty bad. So Let's tackle the other part of the update. Let's tackle the Q function update and see if we can express that in a way that avoids all out of distribution and in fact, all out of sample actions, meaning only use the actions in the data set. So uh, we can say that this expected value in the target is the value of the next state V of S prime. And we could actually represent V of S prime explicitly. We could say, let's just have a second neural network that represents V of S prime. Um, and we can train V of S prime by minimizing some loss. So we, we could take our uh, SA tuples in the training set and uh, we can regress onto them to train V of S with some loss function. Yeah, it's kind of a reasonable way to train uh, V of S and then we can use it in our Bellman backup as V of S prime. If we use the mean squared error loss, meaning that we actually train V of S i to copy Q of S i A i, um, that's a reasonable way to get a value function, but the problem with this is that the action in the data set comes from pi beta, not from pi nu. So when we, when we regress V of SI to Q of SI AI, we're not improving the policy. We're basically getting the value function to be the value of pi beta, whereas what we want is the value of pi nu. If we somehow had action, actions from pi beta, we could plug those in, but we don't have them. So if we do this mean squared error regression, we get a very stable algorithm, no out of distribution actions, that's great, but it's just not going to improve our policy. So kind of just like the behavior cloning before didn't improve the policy and we needed to weight it somehow here, just regressing onto Q doesn't improve the policy. But again, we can come up with a scheme uh, that modifies this a little. And to come up with that scheme, we were going to leverage the following insight. In the data set, we see each action only once. And we see each, uh, each state only once because the state space might be very large. However, we might see other states that are close. So in this picture, you can see these three trajectories. The green circle represents a state that is only seen once in the data, but there are other states that are seen that are kind of similar to it. And if your neural net generalizes that you might say, well, those nearby states, they should probably have values that are kind of similar to this state. But of course you took different actions in those other states and therefore uh, they might have different regression targets. So in general, you could say that your regression targets, once you have some generalization, represent a distribution. Even though at every single state, you've only, you only see one regression target, if you consider nearby st similar states, then you can say there's a distribution of labels for any state. And that distribution, you can draw it as a histogram. And if you're doing mean squared error regression, uh, then you're really picking out the mean uh, under this distribution, the expected value. 
And notice that this distribution is only induced by the difference in the actions because it's a distribution over labels, but the lab labels are, are Q values. So they, those Q values already integrate out all the stochasticity from all the future transitions. So looking at this thing, we could say, well, what if instead of taking the average, what if instead of taking the expected value under this distribution over labels, we kind of shift it to the right. We take the best uh, value that is supported by the data. That's actually a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And all you have to do uh, to get this is to use a quantile or expectile of this distribution. Uh, well, you can kind of roughly think of quantile as kind of the L1 quantity, expectile as the squared quantity. Expectile is a little more convenient. Uh, numerically, it's a little bit more uh, well-conditioned. So could another loss function give us this? So the mean squared error loss gives us the expected value. Could another loss give us an upper quantile or upper expectile? Well, it turns out that for expectiles, there's a very simple change to the mean squared error loss that gives you exactly this. All you do is you weight the positive errors differently than the negative errors. So you're still squaring the errors, but the positive ones are multiplied by one minus tau and the negative ones are multiplied by tau. So you can think of it as a kind of asymmetric squared error loss. This is the mean squared error and this is an expectile. So errors in the positive direction are punished less than errors in the negative direction. So intuitively, that means that you'll make more errors in the positive direction and you can actually show it. It's, it's not obvious, but it is possible to show this will get you an upper expectile of the distribution. And it turns out that if you do this, uh, that's actually the same as training V of S to maximize the Q value over actions within a set. And this is the set of those actions whose probability under your behavior policy is non-zero. So it is essentially a support constraint. Uh, and if you uh, use uh, this expectile loss with a big expectile value, uh, then it'll be close to a max. If you use a small expectile value, it'll be closer to an average. So this is the base of a method called implicit Q learning or IQL. Uh, this was developed by Ilya Kostrykov. Uh, and the reason we call it implicit Q learning is because you're not actually explicitly representing the policy when you do this. You are implicitly improving your policy by using an expectile loss. So you have two neural nets, a Q function and a value function. The Q function is updated by the Bellman equation, and the value function is updated by regressing onto the Q function with this expectile loss, which satisfies the support constraint. So this is kind of the same as Q learning with a support constraint in the maximization, but you don't have the, you don't uh, write down the support constraint explicitly, you enforce it implicitly by the expectile loss. And that corresponds to an implicit policy, which is this constraint R max. Now you don't have access to that policy directly, you just have access to its values. So after you've done implicit Q learning, you still have to recover the policy. And you can recover the policy using the advantage weight or regression method from before, basically exactly the method uh, developed by Ashvin Nair. I'll show you results for this method later. Before I do that, I wanna talk about option two. I'll, I'll describe both classes of methods and I'll, I'll tell you how they compare. So option two is to train the Q function to avoid out of distribution errors. So this is a very different philosophy. It's saying, well, if the problem is overestimation, let's find the places where we overestimate and actually fix them. And you can do that by formulating a modified uh, Q learning method where you have the Bellman uh, error on the bottom. And then you have an additional regularizer that finds a distribution of actions in mu that maximizes the Q values. And then it minimizes the Q values under that distribution. So mu will find those peaks and, will, uh, and then the objective will push them down. So it's kind of like an adversarial training approach. And it turns out that if you do this, you can actually show that the learned Q function lower bounds the true Q function for a large enough weight on the regularizer. Um, the actual method, uh, which is called conservative Q learning, this was developed by Averal Kumar, uh, actually uses a slightly better bound. It minimizes the Q value under uh, these adversarially ch chosen actions and it actually maximizes it under the data. Now that might seem like a really bad idea if you're trying to combat overestimation, but the reason that makes sense is that if you push down on the actions under mu, then eventually all the good actions will be in the data set. And if all the good actions are in the data set, or, or at least in the support of the data, then pushing down on them is not a good idea anymore. And that's where the second term comes in. The second term pushes up on everything in the data. So once all the good actions are in the support of the data, the first term pushes down on them, the second term pushes up on them, and they cancel out. So essentially once you're in support, or, or, or in distribution rather, these two terms cancel out. But if you have good actions out of distribution, the first term will push them down and the second 
from a pushup on something else called come back in distribution. This is no longer a point-wise bound for all actions, but it's still actually a bound for all states in expectation over actions for your policy, which is all you really want because you want to make sure you're not overestimating the value of your policy. Okay, so these are the two classes of offline RL methods. Now let me talk about how we can evaluate offline RL methods. So the first question is, what do we expect offline RL methods to do? Well, there's some bad intuition, which is that it's kind of like imitation learning. You want to copy uh, the, the good data. Uh, that's a, uh, you know, you, you can actually show that you can do better than imitation learning with even with optimal data with offline RL, but th there's some better intuition. I think a better intuition is that offline RL is about getting order from chaos. It's when you have a case more like this, you have data that kind of goes all over the place and you want to find the, the best stuff that is supported by the data. Uh, a very simple example of this is this kind of idealized stitching example. If you have data going from A to B and B to C, you can use offline RL to figure out how to go from A to C, even though you've never done that in the data set. But this is just the clearest example. You can also imagine kind of doing this at the micro level at every point in the trajectory. If you have lots of suboptimal trajectories, you can actually extract a more optimal one from underneath them. Uh, so if you have algorithms that properly perform dynamic programming, they can take this idea much further and get near optimal policies from highly suboptimal data. A very vivid example of this that was done in some recent work by um, Avi Singh uh, is uh, this example where we had uh, the, the task uh, for a robot to pick, on, pick up an object from a drawer, but at test time, the situation might change. Maybe the drawer will be closed or there'll be some obstruction blocking it. If the robot has lots of prior data of other tasks, it can essentially stitch them together. It can figure out that if it's seen drawer opening before and it's seen object picking before, it has everything it needs to understand that it can open the drawer and pick up the object, even though it's never seen those two things together. And then you can do lots of cool stuff like figure out that you can open the drawer and pick up the object, even though you've never done those things in sequence. Figure out that you can close the top drawer. You'll see that in a second. Close the top drawer, open the bottom one, then pick up the object, even though you've never seen that in sequence. So you can do this kind of stitching with dynamic programming. So we developed a, a data set of uh, uh, a benchmark data set for offline RL called D4RL that is made uh, to kind of um, evaluate these kinds of things. So it has basic tasks like the standard Mujoko gym locomotion tasks, which don't really test dynamic programming very well, but then it has tasks like these uh, ant mazes and 2D mazes that intentionally have only suboptimal trajectories that you're supposed to stitch together to figure out uh, a path from this to the goal. It has some more realistic tasks like tasks for dexterous manipulation, uh, manipulating objects in a kitchen, traffic control, and autonomous driving. The gym locomotion tasks are really kind of simple diagnostic tasks that don't test compositionality. The maze tasks are kind of the real evaluation for compositionality, and the other tasks are applications. And what we see when we evaluate different approaches is that uh, there's actually a big difference between the methods that work well on the gym locomotion tasks, which do not test compositionality, and the maze traversal tasks that are intended to evaluate dynamic programming. So this is a big table, so let me walk you through it. The first two columns are basically variants of behavior cloning methods. So regular behavior cloning, behavior cloning only the good trajectories, and decision transformers, which is basically behavior cloning with transformers. Um, these two are other recent offline RL methods uh, that basically either do um, a one-step policy evaluation or just incorporate a behavior cloning regularizer as a policy constraint. Um, and behavior cloning methods and these recent methods do very well on the gym locomotion tasks. This is advantage weighted actor critic, and the last two are CQL and IQL. So most methods get very similar result, uh, results to good behavior cloning implementations on, on the locomotion tasks. So as long as you just filter your trajectories a little bit, these tasks turn out to be very easy. But on the ant maze tasks and the 2D maze tasks also, which are not shown here, but the pattern is similar, here, Compositionality is very important. And here we see a really big difference between CQL and IQL and basically everything else. And the difference is, is whether the method is doing dynamic programming properly, whether it's actually doing that compositionality the way it should. So the takeaway from this is be careful when evaluating offline RL methods, because offline RL can do things that imitation learning simply can't. Uh, it can do better than the best thing in the data, but you need to test the right things to measure that. You need to have an evaluation protocol that actually evaluates dynamic programming. A lot of people simply evaluate on the gym locomotion tasks, which don't really test this. Um, now, I also talked about fine tuning, so let me show you the evaluation of fine tuning. So here we have uh, uh, advantage weighted actor critic. It fine tunes very well, but it has pretty low offline performance. So its final performance after fine tuning is also sometimes low just because it's starting in a much lower spot. CQL has great performance offline, 
but it's too conservative during fine tuning. So that, that effect where it pushes down on the high values basically makes it underperform when it has to do online exploration. IQL generally ends up performing best because it sort of combines the good offline performance of CQL with the good fine tuning performance of advantage weighted actor critic. So I talked about these two options, avoid ever evaluate actions that are not in the data set versus train the Q function so that out distribution actions never have high Q values. Um, option one actually is a, is a more recent thing. Option two predates it, so I had some reverse chronology, but it was easier to explain it this way. In terms of how they compare, CQL has fewer hyperparameters, but it has cleaner workflows with offline fine tuning. CQL also has better theoretical guarantees. Uh, IQL performs uh, slightly better, and it's much better at online fine tuning. So these are kind of the trade offs right now. Um, I think these principles can also likely be combined. So IQL has the disadvantage that it doesn't give you a global Q function. You still need a constraint policy extraction, where CQL doesn't have that issue. And perhaps we could combine those principles. So we still don't know which principles are going to be the most effective, and maybe they can be put together. OK, so uh, I'm about out of time. So uh, I'm going to actually um, skip over most of this section, but I do want to go over uh, two slides. Uh, I want to talk about the, the power of offline reinforcement learning in terms of enabling a much better workflow for online experiments. And then I'll conclude with some closing remarks. So a standard real world RL process looks something like this. You have um, to somehow instrument the task so you can run RL in the real world, which typically involves putting in some safety mechanisms, autonomous data collection, some mechanisms for evaluating rewards and so on. And this is actually a very manual process if you're doing RL in real world settings, for example, with robots. Then you have to wait a really long time for online RL to run. Then typically it doesn't work because in research, nothing works on the first attempt. So then you change the algorithm in some small way. And after you change it in some small way, you have to rerun the whole thing all over again. So this becomes a really costly process. And once you're done with all this, once you've gotten it to work, then you have to throw it all in the garbage and start over for the next project. The offline RL process is actually a lot more straightforward. It has a heavier upfront cost because you have to collect a good initial data set, but you can collect it essentially by any approach you want, human data, scripted controllers, baseline policies, whatever. Then you train the policy offline. And again, it usually won't work on the first attempt. So then you change your algorithm, but you don't have to recollect your data. And that makes this process a lot more painless. Once you've succeeded at solving the problem, um, you can collect more data and grow your data set to improve it further. And you can reuse the data for the next project. And this means that if you use offline RL to iterate on real world problems, your data kind of snowballs and gets bigger and bigger and it makes the next problem easier to solve than the previous problem. So these things are very powerful. It can actually make reinforcement learning in the real world a lot more practical. And that's what we've seen in a lot of our robotics experiments. I don't have the time to go through these, but the short version of this is that we found time and time again that accumulating data in this way and leveraging offline RL allows us to solve fairly complex open world robotics tasks much more effectively than if we had to collect online data every time. Tasks for robotic manipulation with previously un unseen objects, navigation tasks where robots have to search through new environments they've never been in before. These are all cases that demand generalization and the generalization becomes a lot easier if you can reuse large prior data sets. I'll skip over this because I'm about out of time and I wanna briefly take you through some of the challenges. So I talked to you about the dream of offline RL, where you can collect these data sets using any policy or mixture of policies, run offline RL, get your policy and deploy it in the real world, and just magically everything works. Now, of course, there's a gap between that and where we are today. So if you're thinking about research projects to undertake yourself, if you're excited about this area, let me tell you about a few things that I think are big open problems here. One is workflows. So in supervised learning, we have this great workflow. We have a training set, a validation set, and a test set. We don't even worry about what happens in deployment. We trust our validation set. If you get good results in your validation set, you're pretty happy. Is there an equivalent to that in offline RL? We've taken some initial steps in that direction, but I think a lot more work is needed to basically figure out like what's the equivalent of a validation set in offline RL. Statistical guarantees. You have these dist this distributional shift, these counterfactuals. Can you make any guarantees about when it, it will or won't work? What kind of data do you need? And then scalable methods and real, uh, and real large scale applications. I, talk, you know, I, I gave some examples in robotics, but I think this kind of stuff is really promising outside of robotics, domains like dialogue systems, data-driven navigation and driving, lots of other settings. So I think that's a really promising area to explore. All right, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the students who carried out much of this research. I mentioned them also on the, on the individual slides. And thank you for, for listening, and I'd be happy to take some questions.